Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Ah, great. Okay. Well, thanks for meeting. Thanks for meeting, man. Um, do you mind if I record this for the rest of our team? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you tell me first, before we start, just briefly on, so you co-founded Crowd Supply, and what made you do that? Just yeah. Briefly. yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to get back into hardware. So I was a, a software engineer. I just moved into uh, management, uh, actually software engineering management, so I wasn't even really coding that much anymore. And previous to that, I had done a bunch of hardware and uh, had been itching to get back to it. And this opportunity came up to be a co-founder of Crowd Supply and jumped on it. And the crowd yeah. was was that electronics? I'm sorry, say it again. The the hardware you were working on is was that electronics? Yeah, yeah. I, I did a bunch of embedded system stuff. Okay. Um, uh, I was doing Internet of Things before they, that that phrase existed. And uh, we called it the you know, distributed wireless sensor networks back then. <laughs> yeah. Didn't quite roll off the tongue as well. And you guys are quite, are, are you located in, in Eugene right now? No, we're in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Portland, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're pretty, like, uh, free software, like, Libre friendly. And hmm. how, how does that come about? Because I know uh, that, that, quite, that, that comes through quite a bit. Uh, yeah. What got you to do that? Yeah, uh, well, my co-founder and I are both really big open source, you know, free software, open hardware folks. And okay. Yeah, that's what drives us. Okay. Um, and I think I th that and also there's a, a kind of un unmet market need, I think, for that. Um, and so okay. between those two things, you know, we started actually much more broadly than that. Uh, we we started crowdfunding anything that was manufactured. And we used to do, you know, food and clothing and books and, you know, really anything, bicycles. Um, but the, you know, our customers and our own interests really converged on open source pretty quickly. Yeah. I see. Yeah. We, we pushed that one, one layer further and I wanted to see how how crowd supply fits in that or can you help mm -hmm. us but we talk about distributive enterprise so that means whatever we do we also want to teach people to do the enterprise so basically the open yeah. source franchise equivalent of mcdonald's yeah. or a Walmart, I love it. right yeah um and that's um, great is there anything that how you approach it would you guys be able to help in that in that mission like how does does that fit well in your your yeah, I, I think so. You know, what we're trying to do right now is, well, you know, going back to our mission, yep. it's just to bring open source hardware to life, right? And the more that we can teach people how to do that, the more that mission is filled, I think. Um, not everyone wants to do that, so I commend you for that. That's, that's a good step, I think. Uh, but also, as far as our current strategy, um, we're really trying to build up uh, content that we can share with our community and the more a lot of that's going to be educational and so if that's teaching people how to do how to make their own versions of of what is happening on crowd then so much the better that's cool that's cool um yeah so there's a couple of things um let me tell you about the concept of extreme enterprise so you might have have you heard of the, the, the concept of extreme manufacturing by any chance like no. Justice, WikiSpeed, uh, it's mm -hmm. on Wikipedia, but extreme manufacturing is the idea of bringing Agile and Scrum to the, the world of hardware builds. So what we do okay. at, at Open Source Ecology, we, we run workshops. For example, we build printers or larger things like mm -hmm. the tractors or houses. Printers, mm -hmm. we can build a, you know, a dozen or two in a, in a day. We can mm -hmm. also build the big brick press, which weighs about a ton, in, with at least 12 people also in one day. So that's extreme manufacturing. Yeah. Swarming. That's awesome. On parallel builds, that kind of work. And we're trying to, now pushing that to the level of enterprise, we haven't done that. That's a new experiment because we're f finding that mm -hmm. the problem of open hardware is getting people to show up. How do you compress the development cycle into unprecedented yeah. time frames? Which is really the essence of its promise, right? If you have yeah. enough eyeballs, enough people, uh, can you combat the, the com collaborative loss or uh, what do you call it, Brooks mm -hmm. Law? Meaning the mm -hmm. Brooks Law more people you throw at a project, the later it becomes. Uh, that yes. as, long as, you can, as long as you can conquer that phenomenon, yeah. 
and you can coordinate people effectively then in principle we can do yeah. it. so really trying to push the limits of what could that could be and um we're just in the initial stages of planning out a like a 200 to a thousand person event over a weekend where we develop yeah. a product fully to a product right. release level yeah so that means we bring in the it's like a startup camp included plus a a regular kind of a hackathon bring in like the marketing people the product development people uh, mm -hmm. everyone up to okay here's a website here's a product bam mm -hmm. and it's open fully open like radically yeah. open D distributive as in anyone can pick this up and that's the value proposition if you participate in this in this we can solve bigger problems mm -hmm. i was wondering if we could do something on crowd supply that plays with that and and if not i mean we can still uh, still like to see other ideas but um, if we do an event, maybe do you think that crowd supply would be like perhaps a launch on crowd supply could be our distribution, or uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it fits in in a couple of ways there. Um, uh, you know, this year we're we're canceling our event, unfortunately, but usually we have an annual event um, called Teardown, which is a three day long, uh, you know, blitz of of talks and propose, uh, workshops and, and uh, installations. You, you can see some of the footage on, on the site. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it brings together, let's see, last year it brought together over 250 people. Um, and it was really packed. It was three solid days uh, from morning to nighttime so you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's exactly the sort of thing, you know, there's a lot of talent there, a lot of people, wanting to solve problems and they would love to uh, tackle something as a group and, and I think you're right it's a good observation that yeah you know, certainly I've noticed that the more people are in a room when a project is being conceived the, the less likely it becomes that it actually happens um, even even though everyone in the room wants it to happen right uh, it, it's you know people are afraid to take ownership or uh, they're incapable of coming to a consensus or whatever it is and um, and then nothing happens right and so I'd love to put turn that on its head and and show people <laughs> actually here, here's what you can do um, interesting okay um, now when would the so it got canceled this year. What, when's your next teardown? Do you think we could actually do something like that at a teardown or have you done something where you're actually trying to work to one project or um, is it so like a bunch of different projects? It's usually a bunch of different projects, but we do have, I mean, this is not, this is like a, a project light, where right? we do have this, uh, this uh, puzzle hunt where, that everyone participates in. You know, we set up the puzzle hunt and then it's, uh, you, you group into teams and then you try to solve it at night um, uh, on two of the nights. And that's probably the closest we've had. We've had a few workshops that have threatened to do something like this, like to build a machine from scratch and then have some people build stuff out of it, but they haven't actually come to fruition yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say this would be, uh, well, it would be a first for us, but it, it's also very much in line with with the flavor of the event. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'd be a great fit. I, exactly which machine and what product and all that, you know, we can work out. But, but oh, the, next time, the next time we're gonna have it, it's probably gonna be in the spring. Oh, that might be it was, cool. Good timing, actually. If, yeah. If things clear, I mean, right now, like spring is still somewhat questionable, right? I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it would be June. It'd be almost a year, really, exactly yeah. a year from now. Yeah. 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 But that's about but, but the, he, the same time scale he, we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're not going to announce anything because we've already put it off uh, once. It, it was supposed to be in June nineteenth, I think, and then we pushed it to September, like around twentieth. And now we're, we're about to cancel that, so I don't really want to announce a date until we're absolutely sure that, that okay. it might, uh, that it's going to happen, so. Okay, so now to, so selecting a product is one thing, but okay, let's talk about a potential campaign. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much you follow the world of 3D printing, but one big missing item is the high temperature chamber. I think we can mm -hmm. knock that out of the park by the kind of okay. stuff we have done. Uh, we have we're currently selling two kinds of printers. It's uh, we're getting that business off the ground essentially, but we're we're selling those. Mm -hmm. And because of our modular design, we have a way to do. And I can show you more of the details technically uh, to do a high temperature chamber that's fully okay, um, fully enclosed, meaning everything is outside of that hot zone. And I'm talking 
178C max hot zone. Wow. We're not okay. talking about like stuff where you got a lot of conduction happening. This is like fully enclosed. It's essentially you've got uh, we've got a gantry. The chamber mm -hmm. is fully enclosed, fully insulated, um, and there's a cover. It's made of PEI that glides with the print head. So everything outside of the print head tip and the fans blowing in there are outside of the hot zone. And then the okay. bed goes up and down so that uh, only the rods conduct the heat and everything is at high temperature designed for 178C. So that's the thing. Uh, so I'm wondering if that kind of a project would be a feasibility on on uh, crowd supply. As a campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I, not super familiar with the World of 3D printing. I mean, we've certainly, you know, we have a 3D printer right now that an SLA printer that's preparing to launch, um, which is very different. Um, but if it's in fact an unmet need and it's open source, and I, you know, I think the 3D printing community is is very strong at, at crowd supply. There's a lot of people who have 3D printers. We have launched a few like dual extrusion heads and things yeah. like that. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I would say that the idea is certainly workable. Uh, it's a matter of figuring out the details and you know the, the pricing. The you know is it a kit? Is it fully assembled? Uh, you know how, how are we going to ship it? it? Yeah, I imagine it might be kind of heavy. Um, right. So. Uh, do you guys typically? Who does fulfillment and the way crowd supply works? Do you guys typically do that? We do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. now we can change that on occasion, but. Um, our, our fulfillment partner is Mauser Electronics, and so uh, we have everything shipped to their warehouse, you know, prepared ahead of time so that they recognize it as a product that they need to ship and not just like let it sit there, because they get thousands of packages every week. Um, but uh, once it's in their system, you ship it to them and they'll ship it out anywhere in the world, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of complexity here mm -hmm. because part of the attraction to this event is the the concept of the distributed enterprise so when we're doing this the backers get two values one is yet you got by printer by production mm -hmm. so and we don't have a website for that yet but we're we're going to put up a website kind of call it the open source everything store but the idea where you can buy some kind of a consumer good but also if you're you'd like to produce this you are able to produce this because we are designing completely for distributed manufacturing mm -hmm. so that for example if it's a circuit board we would design it so yes you can take it to a board house but if you've got a you know fab lab style seeing decent cnc circuit mill you can also do it mm -hmm. in-house fully mm -hmm. and all that so always design it for low resource high high resource variability yeah. uh, scenarios um along those lines i mean there's a lot of complexity uh but I, I'd love to see what we can do on that. And yeah, I think the I think the printer lends itself to, it would definitely be a big unmet need as in game changer kind of need. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of some of the patents that, that expired, but I don't think this run is into the, the patents that recently expired because it's actually a little slightly of a different strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's really focused on being easy enough to build by ju just about anybody as well. So, so basically avail the next level of 3D printing to the world, which is right now, I mean, it's not great in the sense that you can only print effectively in a couple of materials, and then you've got yeah. hundreds of others that you can't print in because right. they warp and stuff. Yeah. So is that is that what the heater does? Is it is it opens the door to the number of materials or? Yeah, the ability to do a heater allows you to print, starting with ABS. You cannot print ABS without mm -hmm. warping. Like say say you talk about thin layers, it'll warp on yeah. you. Uh, there right. anything else above that polycarbonate? nylon mm -hmm. or whatever that higher temperature things up to PEI the advanced or POM uh, mm -hmm. the kind of like a bushing material all warps like crazy if you tr ever try to p do polyethylene polypropylene mm -hmm. forget about it this is uh, absolutely where the print chamber temperature has to be close to the glass transition temperature without okay. that forget about it and right now the 3d printer world is stuck in this very extremely primitive state where you can't you can't take your plastic trash bags you know this yeah containers. Right. you can't do any of that it, right it's right. just not not there like polyethylene yeah. and polypropylene 
whatever. That'd be interesting to, yeah, I've seen people make uh, filament out of polypropylene uh, like plastic water bottles and stuff like that. Um, but I don't think it's ever been usable. <laughs> well, like, the, the next question to make yeah. a polypropylene filament is, can you use it? Yeah, no, I don't yeah, think so. Right, I mean, right. That would not yeah. be easy without some yeah. of this stuff. Would you mind if I actually continue this conversation? Can I call you on the phone? Because I got to sure. get in the car, but let's keep yep. keep talking and see where we sure. go. Sure, no problem. What's, yep. what's your number there? Uh, 617-710-8529. Okay. Uh -huh. 617-710-8297. Okay. Yep. Great. I'll All call right. you back in like three minutes. Just got to get okay. in the car. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.